Our scripture reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 2. Would you like my good, my good contacts, huh? <laughs> Who got contacts? I think one of us did, but it wasn't me. Neither I nor my darling bride could find my glasses this morning. I don't know where they are. <laughs> A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many, so many gathered there that there was no one left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. So men came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four of them. Since they, since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus and after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, take your mat, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. So he got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of, the, of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well now, I've got a couple of little things I want to say before I get started here. One of, one of them is this. I have got this deer hunting thing figured out now. I want you all to know that. <laughs> I've got it figured out right. First, if you don't have a gun, you go out and get you one. If you got a gun, you get yourself a hunting license. Then you get yourself some fancy camouflage clothes. And don't forget the soap. You got to have soap that doesn't have any smell on it to wash the smell off of you and not put any back. And then you got to have soap for your clothes so that you can wash the smell off your clothes and not put any back. And then just in case when you stop by to get you a sausage, gravy, sausage egg and cheese biscuit on the way to the blind, not to get any smell on your clothes that you're wearing that you already washed to get the smell off, you spray stuff on your clothes so that the deer can't smell you when you get into the woods. You load up your gun, you get it out of the trunk of the car, you, after you bought the fancy camouflage clothes, you put on this big red jacket so that they, everybody in the world can see you. Then you go out and you sit in your blind. The deer walks up right in front of you. You shoot three times. Deer runs off laughing. You police your brass and go home like everybody else. <laughs> that happened down at Roy Clark Place this Friday morning about 8 o'clock. <laughs> One Sunday morning toward the end of the service, the minister asked, How many of you have forgiven your enemies? About three quarters of the hands in the congregation went up. The preacher was not impressed. He said, I said, how many of you have forgiven your enemies? This time every hand in the house went up but one. Sweet little old lady sitting in the back. She said, he looked at her and he said, Mrs. Neely, are you not willing to forgive your enemies? She looked up at him and smiled, the sweetest smile you've ever seen, and she said, I don't have any. <laughs> Preacher looked at her and he said, Mrs. Neely, that's very unusual. How old are you anyway? <coughs> she said, I'm 98. Oh my, Mrs. Neely, would you please come down here to the front of the congregation and tell us how a person lives to be 98 years old without an enemy in the world? So. Several folks on the pew got up. Miss Neely slid out to the end, got her little cane, then she came on down to the front of the sanctuary. She turned around, she looked at them, and she said, It's easy. I outlived them all. 
that's one way. <laughs> Seems to me, as I look back, I, that I talk a lot about forgiveness in the sermon time. Some of you might say too much, like that I talk about that too much. That there's uh, got to be something else in the scripture to talk about besides that. But since my sermons generally come from that thing we call the lectionary, which is a, a three-year set of four scriptures per week, that if I'm preaching from the lectionary, I'm only going to cover a third of the Bible anyhow. And uh, if I'm preaching from the lectionary, then I'm getting it all from the Bible. And if God talks a lot about forgiveness, then maybe I'm supposed to talk about forgiveness a lot too. Like many things in life, forgiveness is a two-edged sword. First, and most importantly, forgiveness is the gospel. Jesus died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins so that we will live life everlasting with God in heaven. Since we preachers are normally ordained to preach the gospel, then it sounds like forgiveness should be the topic of most, if not all, of our sermons. And second, also importantly, is that Jesus teaches that we are supposed to forgive one another. In forgiving each other, we become agents of the gospel ourselves. With all knowing all of that, even so, we have a problem with forgiveness. It's not easy to forgive someone who has offended us. We could say who has sinned against us. But we know from the scripture that we are supposed to. <coughs> it's work to forgive people of their sins against us. But we can do it. How many of us have actually forgiven at least one person in our life? Come on now, it better be all. It better be everybody. I would not be impressed with less than 100%. But when it comes to forgiving sins against God, doesn't that sound like a bit much? I mean, if we forgive the sins against God, what's left for God to do anyway? That was the legitimate position taken by the scribes, Pharisees, and teachers of the law who were sitting there listening to Jesus teach that day. It was a legitimate Old Testament position. You can find the reasons for it in Exodus, and uh, one passage in Exodus, and two in Isaiah. And that was the only Bible they had, you know, the Old Testament. So it was clear to them that forgiveness of sin was up to God alone. Now, they say that if you take out a penny and you scratch most disciples, you'll find a Baptist underneath. <laughs> My experience says that's pretty true. Now, I love my friends who are Baptists. Baptist pastors, some of whom I went to seminary with, and a whole bunch of Baptist folks in Columbus that I went to church with for 12 years. <coughs> but I got to tell you, some of those Baptists, they believe some funny stuff. That one of the things that I never was able to figure out as I sojourned amongst them was they believe that every word in the Old Testament is as authoritative as every word in the New Testament. I've never been able to figure that out because Jesus said in Matthew 5, uh, verses 38 and 39, referring then to Exodus 23 through 25, you have heard it said, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. But, negating everything that came before, I tell you, do not resist an evil person. And if someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. He went on to say, You have heard it said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your neighbor and your enemy, and pray for those who persecute you. Also, Matthew chapter 5. Well, now that's not quite forgiving sins against God. 
But it does speak to the authority of the Old Testament and the New Testament for lives lived since Jesus walked this earth. But in John chapter 20, verse 23, Jesus makes our requirement to forgive one another our sins clear. When he says, if you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, then they are not forgiven. Now, when Exodus and Isaiah say one thing, and Jesus says something else, I'm going with Jesus every time. I'm not going to count that teaching given by God to create a people out of folks who used to run around and kill everybody in a family for the sin of one to what, to what God brought us forward from that point to where Jesus taught us to forgive everybody their sins or they won't be forgiven. If we can forgive sins against God, should we? Well, I think as Christians, you and I are called to follow in Jesus' stead. Does that make sense? We are called as Christians to follow along and do what Jesus did. And according even to Jesus, if we look at John 14, 12, we see he said, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to release the oppressed and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He said, I'm supposed to preach the good news and proclaim freedom for the prisoners. We already said the good news is the forgiveness of sin, right? And who is a greater prisoner in this life? Someone who has the assurance of his or her salvation and is living in an eight by eight by eight cell that they never get to leave. Or someone who is bound by guilt, shame, and fear of dying and going to hell. Who is the greater prisoner? Well, that's not very difficult to figure out, is it? Which one needs the grace of God delivered to us by Jesus Christ in his or her life more? The one in jail or the one jailed by sin and shame, guilt, fear? There is no greater prison on this earth than you and I can create for ourselves inside our own minds. And there is no good news for somebody held up by guilt, shame, and fear. No good news at all other than the gospel, the good news of forgiveness of their sins and the assurance of God's love no matter what. So when we look at that and we say, well, who am I to forgive sin? Remember, Jesus said, if you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. And then you and the sinners is up. 